So my name is Ben Marable. I'm a Splunk security strategist here at Summerford Associates. Um, essentially what that means is I talk a lot of security with uh, with our clients, um, talk about enterprise security and the Splunk security stack um, all the way through from yeah, uh, Splunk Core, Splunk Enterprise Security, the supporting applications, uh, Phantom, uh, UBA, Splunk Security Cloud, all of the great stuff that Splunk can provide in the security space. Um, but here we're focusing specifically on enterprise security and really where we can get value out of enterprise security um, and what kind of drives that and, and a good route through it. So um, hopefully you're expecting to be here. Um, just a reminder, really, I mean, you've all been sent the sort of uh, the agenda of today. So uh, the purpose of the session really is to, you know, look at how ES can really transform the business, um, how we can get data from the cloud and work with new moving towards the cloud as, as majority of organizations are going, overcome common security challenges, um, also look at modernizing the whole security uh, approach um, and also exploring some of the really key concepts within enterprise security. So whether that's notable events, assets, identities, threat intelligence, risk-based alerting and MITRE attack and how we can leverage the MITRE attack. So just quickly before we go into it, because really I do just want to kind of show you the technology, show you around. Um, so just a little bit more about us. So we're Summerford Associates. Um, you've probably heard of us hopefully by now. Um, so we are, you know, an elite partner of Splunk. Um, we've, we are elite partner for both being a reseller and also for professional services. Um, we're one of the leading professional services team in Europe um, and uh, yeah, we're getting a lot, quite a few accolades through the Splunk kind of partner ecosystem as well. So that's just a little bit about us. Um, so I'm just going to move into the demo. Um, so if you just bear with me as I switch tabs, did just a little bit. Um, okay, someone's unable to hear me. Um, is that uh, presumably that might just be a one-off? Is anyone else able to hear me? If you could just let me know in case I'm talking for and no one can actually hear what I'm saying. That would be a bit of a problem. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So uh, maybe it's your, your um, thanks. Thanks all. So just to clarify, excellent. Um, not sure if it's a problem with your end with your speaker, but um, I'll, uh, I'll continue um, if that's all right. So so if we just go into it, one of the first things I want to kind of explore with you guys um, is really around how Splunk Core transitions into security and then that transitions into enterprise security and really how that kind of drives through. So um, presumably you've all seen Splunk uh, Core. Um, you understand how Splunk Enterprise works, Splunk Cloud, Splunk Core. We kind of use it as a terminology to cover both of those. Um, what is Splunk essentially? Uh, if you haven't, then absolutely get in contact. We'll be able to give you a different webinar on, on Splunk and how that really works. But just for, this is all on security. So if we just leverage from one to the other, what we really want to do to be able to use Splunk for security is start thinking about the content that needs to be driving that um, that mission to get towards security, okay? And there is a lot of content, right? And we have an application here called Splunk Security Essentials, which really provides a big library of content to um, uh, to to their fingertips, really, of the Splunk engineers, those that are using Splunk, and really kind of being able to leverage all of the kind of useful things that are going on across the world, right? We're using Splunk. Splunk's a leading technology. It's used by many, many organizations around the world. They have their own security research team that develop their own security content, and then they can produce that into the Splunk Security Essentials to really allow you to get the value out of it. So just quickly, this is a free app. With Splunk Core, you don't need enterprise security to use it. However, it does have use cases that require enterprise security to get them leverage out of them. And so we're just going to explore a little bit around here um, to start with. So one of the places I want to take you to start with is on a, a security data journey, really. And what we really need from data to provide security at the other end, right? So how do we know what data sources to to bring in? Um, how do we know um, 
how to kind of focus our, 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 our efforts on making sure that we have the widest scope of security coverage, really. Um, so what we have is a, uh, a data journey. This is Splunk's vision, essentially, for steps or stages to go through to become more advanced in your detections, okay? So one of the first things to do is think about collecting the basic sign of logs, okay? And each stage without, throughout this has, you know, a description of what we would expect to see from this stage milestones what we'll be looking for trying to achieve and any challenges we might see at that stage um, as we progress through and if you scroll down for each of these stages you'll also see the data sources that we deem to be the most valuable to provide the most content within that stage um, and to provide the most sort of security coverage right so it's all well and good trying to look and leverage the stage six kind of advanced detections but if you've got the most advanced capabilities for security but you've left a simple backdoor open an adversary is not going to use the most advanced tools they don't need to i mean they're inherently lazy they have other things they would like to be doing um, so they'll use the most easiest the most efficient way of getting in to break the defenses right so it's really important to use the building blocks and this staged approach can really help with that guide going from essentially zero all the way up to a very advanced detection system okay so we've got that stages there is a nice big pdf um, that you can find on our website you can also find a splunk's website that splunk have produced essentially about this kind of guide and goes into a lot more detail around what you would expect to do in each of these stages but within the app they also include it here and as you kind of step through you'll see everything changes milestones challenges data sources and so forth you'll also see on the right hand side the amount of use cases that become applicable from that position so we're talking, you know, we get more security monitoring, we have more compliance, more instant response, more SOP, more inside a threat, maybe some advanced threat detection as well. So as we kind of progress through that, that kind of opens up our capabilities a lot wider. So we're talking about all this content, this use cases, okay? So where is it, what is it? Um, well, within the security content page, you can kind of see the whole lot. So in this, we've got 654 different use cases um, that are available. Um, 313 of them are filtered with the current filter set that I've got here. Um, you can filter on a, a number of different things. So if you want to filter on the data sources that you have, um, you can do that. Um, there's also a, a specific data sources that you want to filter down on. So if we're looking for cloud AWS, we could filter on AWS. Uh, we simply just check that box. And then below what we'll get is all of the AWS relevant kind of uh, use cases okay so we can kind of really match down and filter down and as we scroll through you kind of see things that are relevant to aws um and so forth so that's suspicious container image name you know all sorts of different things and whether they need core or they can be leveraged with es is really down to that kind of uh, that kind of color in the top left corner where it's enterprise security or this is splunk core essentially um, but if I want to just come back to all, you can see um, all of the different ones that might be coming up. Um, you can filter based on MITRE ATT&CK if, of course, you're against, you're targeting the MITRE ATT&CK framework as a way of coverage. You can also filter on the kill chain phases if you need to think about certain areas within the kill chain that maybe you're a little bit uh, lacking in coverage. Uh, you can do that and have, have a kind of an approach from that perspective for you. Of course, you can do both, right, which is really, really useful. Um, you can also look for the security use case areas right so if you're interested in cyber threat or application security you can do that as well and it's really good to be able to filter this all down and then kind of target what you, what it is that's important to the business right now um, and kind of work from that approach one of the other really good things about security essentials is the ability to bookmark and, and uh, tick off certain use cases when you've got them implemented so you can track the use cases as they go through the progress so this is something that's of interest to you you can bookmark it this is something that you've actually fully implemented you can go and check that off and there's also different stages within those bookmarks to say okay i'm waiting for some data i've tested this or i'm waiting for a test um, it's ready to be deployed and it's now deployed so you can kind of progress those use cases and have a use case tracker that kind of al allows you to kind of progress them um, a lot along with notes for each of these but if we just click on one of these, so um, I'll just pick this one. Um, this takes us to a new page that actually shows us the breakdown of the search and how it kind of works. So across the top, what you're gonna see is um, the details around the search, what it is, the description, um, that side of things, uh, what use case area it comes into, security monitoring and compliance, the a number of alerts we'd expect to see, so medium, the difficulty of the SPL, so whether it's easy, medium, hard, that side of things, um, 
whether you're bookmarking it, you can bookmark it, and also all the mitre attack tactics and techniques that are relevant and the threat groups, of course, um, and the kill chain phases, right? And what's really key, of course, is the data sources that this could be driven from, okay? So audit, user activity audit, Azure, GCP, AWS, Windows security, that side of things, okay? Um, and then as you scroll down, you can actually see the search. So here's the search. Um, this is how it's constructed. Um, now, if you're kind of new to Splunk or, you know, uh, you're not very um, experienced with the SPL side of things, this is a really good tool to actually allow you to uh, learn from uh, those that are generating these searches and what the, each different step within the search means because it has full comments on our, all of this. So, you know, we're looking at the change data model, we're filtering on deletes, we're listing the number of deletions by source user, that's what the stats is really doing. Um, and then we're doing, we've got a where, where clause that's saying, okay, we're at least one account involved. Um, and then we're getting information from the asset and identity information around it. That's what this is doing for the user to get more context around that user account so we know who their manager is. Who uh, what their phone number is, where they work, what sort of location they're in, um, any categories like whether they're privileged account, um, all of that sort of thing. And that's what this search category is. So we're only looking where they're privileged accounts sort of thing. So that's how we kind of break it down and build it. And also with this, you get a few more a bit additional context to it, right? So how we implement it, any known false positives, how we would respond. So, you know, as a kind of a, a starting point, you've got a you've got a use case that you you know you need to look at or you you found it. What what do you do if you see it in the environment, right? Even if it's just the basic kind of things that you would want to look at. Um, and then yeah, as I say, known false positives for it uh, and so forth. Okay, so one final place I want to just take you within Security Essentials before we crack into ES really um, is a viewpoint of all this content, right? So, you know, we've got 650 pieces of content. We've got a track of all our data that we have in the system. Um, Splunk knows what data we've got in the system. So if we want to map all of that against the MITRE ATT&CK framework, what we can do is we have an analytics advisor for this MITRE ATT&CK framework, and we can draw a picture of all the use cases that you have in um, the environment. Uh, so the 654 here we're totaling, um, and the darker the color for this particular piece, the more that we have active and available um, and so forth, right? So, you know, the lighter the color, maybe we don't have use cases in this particular area of the MITRE ATT&CK matrix, maybe Splunk's not the right tool for that. Um, you could still use Splunk to track that and build this use case up, even if something else, some other tool that you've got, like a Voronis or a Centrifier or an Okta or, or whatever the external tools are that you're using to cover that particular use case, um, you can still bring that into this reporting engine, okay, to be able to report on this particular MITRE ATT&CK matrix, all the use cases that you have. And of course, this is currently the enterprise one, but if you're interested in a cloud one, then of course we can just do that and filter based on cloud, and that will bring up the cloud matrix and also color code it based on all the different content that we have available. This is coloring by total, but we can also color by active or available or needs data. So we can track and you know cover what we're really actually interested in and kind of where we can get to. I can see more people asking questions, so I will come to the questions at the end if that's all right. Um, but I, you know, I checked earlier just because I wanted to check no one was having problems. But okay, so we'll come to the questions at the end. So please fire them away into there, though. Okay, so that's your Splunk Security Essentials, and that is a, a key companion app really to any Splunk security journey, whether you're using Splunk Core, Splunk Ascent, like Splunk Cloud, Splunk Enterprise, or if you're using Splunk Enterprise Security, or if you're using anything else, UBA or Phantom, you know, it's a really good kind of assistance to all of those. Um, so it's really fundamental, but it's important to cover that and how that really kind of helps. So if we just take a look at ES and just now, so just bear with me. Or rather just take a sip of water. Um, so, Splunk Enterprise Security, this is generally uh, the front page of Splunk Enterprise Security. Um, this is what's known as the security posture. Everything that I show you in this demo is all going to be out of the box. Um, there's no custom uh, additions to it. Um, you know, this is what you would expect to see if you have the technology um, and expect to see what, what's going on. Of course, we're generating data here uh, on a very regular occurrence, all of its demo data. Um, it's over and over again. So you will see significantly high numbers um, because we're just 
exploring everything that we can and being able to cover every single point that we can. Um, and because of that, yeah, we get high numbers. So I wouldn't expect your environment to have, you know, 10, 15K um, notable events on a daily basis at all. Um, in fact, you wouldn't have a chance of being able to deal with those. So, but just so you're aware, this is what we're sharing, kind of, that's a really key point really is it's demo data. So what do we actually see? So this is the first point of call that you would usually go to as a security analyst at the beginning of the day. Um, you would come in here and you would look at the number of uh, notable events um, within potentially your area, right? So you might have a speciality, you might have a domain speciality, you might be a, someone who knows about authentication, you might be someone who knows about network kind of security or even endpoint security. You might have those kind of differential kind of areas and that might be your key point of focus um, as you come in and kind of start dealing with these alerts that are coming through. What do we mean by a notable event? Well, a notable event is, a, is an alert that's generated from what we call a correlation search, a search that's able to uh, correlate over one or many different data sources to generate a, uh, a, an indicator of compromise, okay? And we use a notable event as a way of kind of um, tracking that. And the process of creating that notable event takes into account both the actual correlation search severity, so um, whether that's something like a brute force, maybe that's a low severity or high severity, whatever, however you view that, and also the user that might be involved in that, right? So if you've got a brute force against the CEO, that's probably a critical issue. If you've got a brute force attempt against a new graduate that's just got a new laptop and they've just joined the company, probably not as critical, still could well be, you know, medium they might be in the administrative team they might have admin rights privilege rights they you know you could leverage different levels of of that um, priority for these user accounts based on all these different factors so what we really do is we create a notable event based on the severity of the correlation search and the priority of the asset or the identity that's involved and that's how we generate this urgency of how to deal with things so one of the first points you might want to deal with of course is the critical urgency notable events um, these are the things that really should be looked at first so that's why we give it the urgency because we know sometimes seams can produce uh, quite a bit of noise um, and I'll talk about how we can reduce that noise using risk-based alerting a little bit later but for now we're talking kind of that sort of situation where we get an alert because we've seen an indi indicator of compromise um, and as I say I'll move to risk-based alerting a little bit later so um, the other things that we can see on here of course is notable event occurrences so you might get very popular notable events now do we need to tune that note that correlation search that's triggering that is it creating too much um, notable events you know um, and with all of these you might get like a you get a spark line which is uh really useful so say if you've got something like excessive failed logins you might get a spike at 9 a.m that's probably reasonable um you know people just starting the, for the day and just forgotten their password maybe they changed it the day before or the last weekend it's a monday um or you might have more of a heartbeat right and a heartbeat is more indicative of a scripted attack and therefore something that you should be more concerned about so that's why the spark line is there it could be really helpful as well um such such as this one right the short-lived account seems to be very occurring very repetitive okay we're demo data we're creating it every 15 minutes or so um top notable event occurrence by host of course right so we've got hosts that are particularly getting a lot of alerts um and that's another place that we could look at and drive down and drill down into the information now with splunk everything is clickable and drillable this dashboard is just a viewpoint to the starting point okay so if i want to look at this particular host i can go ahead and click on that and that would take me into the incident review page now the incident review page has come on quite a bit since the version that I've got here in the demonstration, okay? And if we want to explore later versions of what they can do, um, absolutely, we could do that in a little bit more cl closely. Um, but right now, this is the, the environment that I have available to be able to show you with all the con data. Um, but as I say, this has come on quite a little bit of a way since, since you've got this viewpoint now. Um, but fundamentally, it's still the same, right? So we have a collection of all our notable events um, they come up below we've got a filters across the top that kind of allow us to filter down on all of that information so we can filter based on the urgency the status of that notable event so this is a sim right this is for actually dealing with the events um, event management it's not just a case of notifying you so because of that you know you've got the process of being able to create it as new in progress closing it out all of the different steps that you might want to do and you can add your own steps in here as well if you need to 
um, you can filter by still the owner. So if you want to look at just your own events, you can filter based on that domain, like I mentioned before, whether you access your interest in or network or whatever. Um, you can filter based on a particular search, of course, everything in Splunk is searchable, um, or you can filter on a specific uh, correlation search if you're just looking at specific um, notables that you're of interest to. And of course, you can filter on time. So once you've done all of that, you can go ahead and hit submit. And then basically what will happen is you'll filter down everything below. So I've added in these two security domains. So it's going to filter based on those two particular domains and you'll see these events. Now, if you want to look at one of these, you can expand it. So this is a brute force by the looks of it. It's failed authentications 1,394 times and successfully authenticated 345 times in an hour. Um, it's got a very high risk score, this particular asset. It also tells you all the information around this asset. So it's owned by Bill Williams. Um, it's in Pleasanton in the USA. Um, uh, it's getting some tags around what it's trying to, what's going on with it as well. So you can tag all these notables as well. Um, and really you get all that information around it on the left hand side. Now on the right hand side, you're going to get the correlation search, a direct link to that correlation search. So one of the ways of, of, of tuning these is really coming in here going, right, okay, I need to go and actually have a look at that correlation search. Now I'm not going to break down the correlation search in this demo, but if you wanted to have a look at that, we could go into it another time, absolutely. Um, and how that gets kind of all built up, you know, the schedule, the throttling, um, the, the noticeable event, the severity it creates, the drill down, which I'll come to in a second, all these sort of things that you can kind of add to, as well as the next steps, right? So there's no next steps defined for this, but for any correlation search, any noticeable event that you create, you can create a number of next steps to really get to that sort of, that progress of kind of being able to progress to the next, for the analyst to kind of know what to do about it, right? So what do I do about it? Well, you can build that into the actual content so that when someone finds the noticeable event, they know how to progress through um, and those next steps can be shown down that bottom right. Um, one of the other links, of course, you can see who's been dealing with it. So we're auditing everything in Splunk, right? So we audit who's being uh, actioning on this particular uh, use case. Um, so we can go and click on that and, and show who's been dealing what with the notable event. Uh, we can also look at the underlying events, right? So if we want to go and have a look at the contributing events to this, we can go ahead and click on that and that will show you all the logon attempts by the system, okay? So um, we can go and do that from this particular source. Um, how many authentication events they're trying to get to and all that sort of things. Um, now you'll also see these adaptive responses have popped up. So aligned to this correlation search um, that generated this notable, you've got a number of adaptive responses that have been run against it because of it's been alerted. Now one of them was to create a notable, which we're seeing here. The other one was to actually generate some risk into the risk, um, the risk index essentially, or the risk framework. Now the risk framework has been progressed um, to be able to do risk-based alerting. And what do I mean by risk-based alerting? It's really about being able to kind of take a number of different, not very indicative on their own, uh, that there's a problem that someone's there, but more indicative of um, potentially leading to something. But really what you want to be able to do is, is leverage lots of different pieces of information, like potentially someone uh, creating a new account on a system. Now on its own, that doesn't mean that there's a security breach that has occurred in the business. But if they've created an account on that system and then that system goes out and connects to uh, a known threat IP or domain, um, and then that system then makes some changes that it wouldn't normally change and so forth. You've got three different things here across different MITRE tactics that are involved, or cyber kill chain in fact, right? Um, that are involved over that. And so what we do is we, we, we basically take a record of all of these, which is what we call as a risk rule um, to, risk, to, to track. And then we create a risk indicator rule to coverage across all of those and say, okay, well, if we see three different tactics involved in a particular system or a particular user, because we're leveraging over the asset or identity frameworks, um, then let's alert on it. And that's, you know, it's not a pattern of specifically this, then this, then this, I mentioned it in that way, but it could be anything across any number of different tactics that suddenly then it gets alerts on it. So what we can really do is take in those noisy events, take in those things like someone creating a new new account. There's quite quite generally can be quite noisy in environments, but 
you don't have the time to triage it on its own, but take that information in and correlate it with other information using the risk-based alerting approach to really narrow down the number of alerts. Um, and it's the same with something like this for brute force, where you wouldn't you wouldn't then create a notable, you would just go straight into creating a risk um, and you would leverage the risk and you would say, okay, you would give it 20 points of risk. So not only can you track it for a certain number of tactics, you can also track it if suddenly this system or user has just got a certain amount of risk, right? This is 32,000 points of risk. That's quite a lot. Um, you know, if you wanted to alert anytime someone got over, you usually would build it around 100 points. This is obviously excessive. Um, you would want to alert on that as well. And then you would have a look and you would investigate that, which I'll come to about how we can investigate this actual asset itself. Now, the other thing about automation is these have done these have been done automatically, right? So we've triggered a notable event and the, uh, so we triggered a correlation search um, and that's created a notable, it's created a risk analysis. Some of the other things that we can do out of automation essentially is run adaptive response actions. So we could have these in the next steps down the bottom here as you know, get the engineer to click on it and run it. Or we can go ahead and run it straight against this, right? So um, we could, um, send stuff to Tanium to ask a question, get results for an external uh, technology, we could go ahead and order a pizza, right? So if we see a certain critical level event that happens after 5 p.m., um, you've got, okay, well, we need to order pizza because we know that the engineers need to stay behind and deal with this. We can't leave it till 9 a.m. in the morning, so let's just order them a pizza and not let them worry about it, right? So you can hook into all of these different things. Um, and you can expand this adaptive response action framework and you can kind of expand it and kind of get a lot of other things in there as well of of course going into phantom and doing the phantom automation which is another topic for another day to some extent um or you can go and open tickets close tickets you can go and talk to semantic um you can add threat intelligence because this is now something that's interested you want to track it again all of these different response actions to automate the process of going through that whole steps Good, right, so as you know to our framework, one of the other things that you can do with this, okay, is actually pivot from here. So um, if we take in context this source 10.11.36.20, we can click on here and this will allow us to pivot from here to other areas of the environment. So if we wanna see who's accessed to it, who's logged on to it, um, who's logged on from it, um, who's, if we want to map it or Google it, if we want to see what the IDS or IPS is saying about it, if we want to see what malware is involved in it, um, if we want to start a stream capture, if we want to actually packet capture on it, okay, we can use Splunk Stream. Um, that's another technology within the Splunk ecosystem that allows you to basically capture off the wire, the actual um, traffic that's going on, if you want to turn that on. Um, if you want to see what your firewall's going, you know, where this is going to and from, you can do that as well. Any updates are involved in it any vulnerabilities are on the system, you can do that. So you can really pivot from here to different areas of enterprise security um, to really get a kind of a lot more uh, information around it. Now, one of the places I want to do is go into Asset Investigator. So this is a, um, a form really that gives us all the similar, similar sort of information that we saw there across the top. So, um, you know, it's owned by Bill Williams, it's in Pleasanton, um, this is the IP address, this is latitude, longitude, um, you can see this is in a PS, PCI domain trust, okay, so that's um, that's interesting, it's category PCI, um, all of that information, it's also a critical asset um, for whatever reason, and then if you scroll down, you can see a number of different swim lanes, um, is what they're called in Splunk. Um, and this is a really good way of kind of extrapolating out the information because this is a noisy box. It's got a lot of things going on it. So really being able to kind of differentiate all the different areas that we might be interested in. And what's really useful is being able to pattern match over this time period, right? So we're looking over a day here to last 24 hours um, and we might see a number of failed authentications and a successful one. We might then see a connection to a client and control center. We might see some malware, might see a change on it. We might see some threat you know all of that kind of over a period of time but it's not going to be a case of what all happens then dun, 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 dun. it could be here it could be there it could be there it could be then over here and then over here and so forth so you can kind of get an idea of how if you did that with the machine you'd have to crunch the whole 24 hours if it was even only in 24 hours it could be in a wider period right crunch all of that together and then try and look at those patterns but for a human to see the patterns it's very very easy we can just see that from the visuals um and then in terms of what we want to look at, if we hover over and select any of these, you'll see on the right all the different events that have been selected. Um, you can see the, the sort of 
high level uh, fields that have been taken out um, and extracted so you can see kind of information around it. So uh, scores, severities, users that are involved, actions, destinations, sources, um, signatures, all of this sort of thing. And as you, you know, you can filter any of these, you can kind of select out certain ones if you want to, and it will regenerate all of those events. And if you want to see those events, you can go ahead and click on go to search and it will show you the events that you've selected here in this viewpoint, which is a really powerful way of just kind of selecting what you want to, pinpointing, narrow down what you need to. If you want to share this link with anybody else in your team, you can do that. It creates a specific link with all of this information, where you are with timeframes, all of the uh, events that you've got selected. And you can see this is like the longest link in the world because it really does take you to exactly the same point um, that you're seeing right here and I never get to the end of the link by the time I've finished so um, so that's really good and also you can create a notable event straight from here as well so this is a really good kind of tool to kind of start exploring that asset around a wider kind of concepts and kind of looking in other ways um, not only do we have it for assets we also have it for identities so very much if you want to look at a particular identity maybe Bill Williams here you can go and have a look at what Bill Williams is up to and you'll get swim lanes around machines they're connected to changes they've made malware they've been involved in all that side of things as well which is great now we've deemed this to be of interest we've done some very initial triage okay so what we would do normally next is look at this particular thing click on edit so we're selecting it we're editing it maybe we're going to start you know progressing that status we're going to you know maybe we want to change the urgency maybe we don't maybe we want to assign it to me we can go ahead and do that and maybe we want to comment um looks suspicious maybe put a bit more useful kind of things in there it needs to be at least characters 20 characters one two three four um so we can put in a comment that allow it means that we can actually start actually tracking that and saving that so we're editing that event so we're starting to do some triaging on it the other thing that we can do is actually add this into an investigation right so um if you come back um so we can check it and we can also add that into the investigation so it's now owned by me we've got it it's in progress um we click this and add it to investigation so um Got an investigation here from uh, November 2020. Let's create a new one. My investigation, uh, July 2021. Um, it's new. We'll click save, and this is going to add it into this brand new investigation. So, with enterprise security, what we have is an investigation framework that kind of allows us to track and triage different notable events, different searches, different dashboards that we've been viewing, um, different times we've drunk tea. If you want to you know talk about the tea side of things um so one of the one of the viewpoints here of course is the timeline so we've got that notable event we've added that in um here's a list view of all of that okay um which is great maybe we also then want to add in a different engineer we could go ahead and do that you know maybe we need to pass it over to somebody at the end of the day maybe they can get involved um maybe we we'll want to add in any other investigation artifacts so one of the things you saw there is it took the 10.11.36.20 and put it in my workbench which i'll come back to in just a sec uh, maybe we want to do a quick search and add that in maybe we want to add in some notes we could add a new note started investigation that probably happened you know uh for 17 or 20 minutes ago i think that's an hour ago i think it's on utc time um add it in the timeline yeah that's cool um add in whatever and also you can add attachments right so if you take a screen capture or um you've got a csv file or something like that you could go and add that in as well so we've got a, a way of kind of tracking this taking notes of all the all the events that are going on um and then that goes into my timeline so the notable event happened at 101 so um yeah okay uh and then we got the slide view so we can see it from a slide perspective as well and we can go through that from from all of that which is fine um and then another really key thing that you can do here is actually look at your previous actions right so i've looked at some dashboards so i've done it in the last 30 minutes um i can just basically search and audit mine so i went into the asset investigator here it is essentially i can go ahead and add that into my investigation and that was you know that allows me to then have a drill down to that asset investigator and go back into it right so here it is and if i want to view the dashboard i can go ahead and do that and it'll take me back to where i sort of was a second ago with the asset investigator so what deemed and what i used as you know determining that this is actually something i need that needs warrants investigating um, I can add that in as well. So I've got a track and 
trace of all of the events that have actually been in, in this investigation, whether that's notables, whether that's dashboards being viewed, whether that search is being run on the fly, which you can add in, of course, as well, which maybe I was investigating, or um, notes, right? Notes, external tools that you might have seen as well. Um, and then just to come back to the workbench, really, if you want to then, what's really cool is you, it pulls in the artifacts for you, right? And you can add in additional artifacts if you want to. Um, this is a particular asset and you can go ahead and select it and then you click explore and it will go and bring up a number of different dashboards that can be uh, expanded if you want any specific addition one, additional ones, showing the risk score over time, showing the idea that S alerts that's aligned to it, showing the system vulnerability, showing any notable events aligned to it, uh, detailing around what this is. Apparently it's got a Cisco router, the OS, Tenable, Nessus is saying this is a Cisco router, which is interesting. Um, the last updates that are available on it, um, that side of things, um, you know, my endpoint data, right, what file system's been changed, registry activity has been going on and service activity. So, so Cisco router, it's got a lot of registry information, probably got some sort of interesting OS sort of thing here. Um, port activity that's going on, all this kind of ways of doing investigations really um, within this, um, uh, leveraging the artifacts within the investigation side of things, which is uh, really, really good, really nice. Um, one of the other extensions to this and to enterprise security is an application called SA Investigator, okay? So SA Investigators have been around for a little while now, um, and Spunk took a lot of what was in SA Investigator and built this workbench kind of frame point out. Uh, to kind of show you this side of things in the investigations, which is really cool. However, SA Investigate still has additional things that this does not. And so it is a very good additional app to add on to an enterprise security environment um, to really drill down even further, right? And do some more investigations, go into more in-depth investigations across all sorts of different data sources and so forth. So if again, I look at this particular IP address, um, so much like you saw me just then in the workbench view, we can go ahead and have a look across lots of different areas, whether that's certificates, whether that's DNS, whether that's updates, authentication, vulnerabilities. And we've got all these different viewpoints that we can kind of drill down and provide all these dashboards for you um, in the details, what that detail is about the asset, notable events by it, um, notable events by source, by destination, um, traffic that's going to and from, right? All of that side of things is kind of an extension to that workbench, as, as I say, it, kind of was a viewpoint of how they kind of leveraged that workbench but you know as a point it is an extension to it so it's a very good kind of add-on to it good okay now i'm just going to take maybe five ten minutes just to kind of show you some of the dashboards that are in enterprise security now um by no means can I cover everything in enterprise security in an hour. Um, there is a lot of content here. I do want you to take that away and think, yeah, there's a lot here that you get with enterprise security because there absolutely is. Um, but I do want to just touch a few points to kind of show you different areas, including the threat framework. I've talked about RBA. I've talked about investigations and that side of things but i do want to talk about threat i do want to talk about generally how you would kind of go from a for a hunting kind of perspective right how you would use enterprise security to start hunting for things it's all well and good getting notified about stuff but you can't get notified about everything so what can you really do to kind of go hunting now I talked a little bit from the incident review page about how you can switch into um say uh seeing what asset what a system has been going logging on to or from um so we have within here a number of domains so as a speciality you might take access within the access domain we've got some dashboards one of them we will have is called access center and this gives us a very high view a point view across the entire estate of what's going on in terms of authentication so as you kind of understand the day-to-day -day, what we'd expect to see we can start seeing things that are out of the norm based on just generally knowing what's normal uh, for the day, you know, are we getting more and more sources authenticating? More and more destinations, they're going up or down, there's the trend lines. Are the authentications over time, but actions, what users, what systems are generally creating my most authentication events? You probably understand that you might have a system that creates a lot of authentication events. Maybe it's a, some sort of scanner that has to authenticate before it does whatever it needs to scan on the box. That's fine. You understand that. That's good. But if you start seeing something else come on the bot in the environment that's you know significantly creating a lot of events, that's probably something you could investigate and look into. So you create this kind of. We have this dashboard to just kind of look into it. 
And if we filter down, we can filter down on all the events, right? So maybe we're just looking at contractors, right? And we're maybe just looking at contractors that have privileged access. So we can filter based on that and it will regenerate the alerts based on privileged contractors. Okay, so we don't have any privileged contractors. So that was good, good, uh, good selection. Um, so let's just filter on all. Um, so any privileged accounts that we have across the estate, what they're doing, you know, logging in failing that side of things okay so we can go ahead and do that and if we want to then click, go and click on any of these right we can go and click on this particular thing or any of these dashboards and it will take us into the access search and this is a really easy way of viewing the events for authentication so here we're looking at all of the authentication events from 10.9.8.8 between times of uh, the last 43 minutes it looks like uh, or 24 hours at an hour okay so the last 24 hours um and it groups them it statistically groups them and gives you the count of the number of times this user has logged on from this source right so um there's sometimes they're failures sometimes successful and then you can also see the events underneath right so if you really want to narrow down and say okay i'm interested where oracle has been logging on um across all of my systems within the last uh 15 minutes where's oracle been logging on um you can go ahead and do that and that will show you all the systems that have oracle logging on within the last 15 minutes which i would always pick one in a live demo that didn't show me anything so here we've got root where root is involved in logging on for the last 15 minutes so you can see the slight difference in speed between the top one and the bottom one that's really just about the way that it's kind of being produced with data models versus non-data models um, but you can see an ever so slightly and we do this because we create data models um, within enterprise security we leverage the common information model to really progress and accelerate the search capabilities so we can scan hundreds and thousands of events every 15 minutes to be able to give the most up-to-date most information uh, and really get narrowed down on it so there's a lot of work that goes into building enterprise security by using all of the all of the tools in the toolbox for Splunk to kind of get the most out of it in terms of search and resources. So we've got an access center, we've got an access search, so we've got a high level view, we've got a search. Um, what we can also do within this is kind of look at kind of operational security side of things. So, you know, users that have logged on for the first time in the last seven days. Okay, so these users have logged on to this bo these boxes in the last seven days, that's interesting. Um, inactive accounts, why are they still around um you know that sort of thing expired identities why is any accounts that have been expired are they still around that sort of thing so we've got dashboards that can kind of do your operational side of things to make sure that you're just doing the 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 good stuff that you should be doing anyway um but most organizations aren't always doing um but it's a good way of just quickly viewing that side of things and kind of uh, you know narrowing that down as well in this in this area we've got account management so who's making changes to accounts doing that quite common and default account activity right so people like guest administrator root um oracle all of those default accounts from different applications why are they being leveraged really they should be put broken away put in a in a break glass scenario we need to be have accountability for them so we can go and have a look at any of those default accounts being used and kind of really drill down on that so that's uh something else that we can look at okay now so in the interest of time i'm going to quickly just touch a few more so if we want to look at endpoint we can talk about malware center and search so similar to access center and search so you've got a high level view way of narrowing down if you want to look for particular signatures operations this is really good at showing you what client versions you've got in your malware client what um, malware clients you have out there what signature versions you've got um, we can see what my systems are doing in terms of OSs, uh, in terms of updates, we can see what's going on, any particular changes to endpoints, whether the time is in sync, all of that kind of great stuff within the endpoint kind of realm. And network, we can do things like what our traffic is doing. So again, filter down for this particular host, see what traffic is going to and from it. Um, have a high top level viewpoint about the amount of traffic that's going around my environment, how much, how many bytes are going through, firewalls, that sort of things. Vulnerabilities, Across the estate right so you know one of the key things that um, I've got clients that I talk very regularly with they find really useful about Splunk is just the reporting capabilities um, that other tools maybe don't have so if we feed the information from those other tools into Splunk we can really report on the number of vulnerabilities and 
the security operations program and how we're reducing the number of vulnerabilities, not increasing the number of vulnerabilities across the estate, that side of things, and how when we do these are patching and updates, that kind of reduces the vulnerabilities. All of that kind of reporting across time, and not only do you get the vulnerability information, you can you can correlate that vulnerability information with the update information, right? Because they're generally quite linked, um, vulnerabilities and patches, you can patch them. So you could get a kind of a better picture of this. So, because that's usually a good program that goes on in security teams, it's kind of patching vulnerabilities and that side of things. So you can do that as well. Um, with vulnerability operations, you're talking about things that have been around for a long time, that side of things. So vulnerabilities that haven't been patched, why not? That side of things and all that. And there's lots of other things in here as well. So in the interest of time, and I want to allow some time for questions, I'm just going to quickly come into here. Um, so we talked about RBA, um, you can come in and view RBA for a security intelligence risk analysis. You can see all the kind of RBA pieces. Um, just on the threat pieces though, so Splunk Enterprise Security has a threat framework. In fact, it has five frameworks uh, in total. So it has a risk framework, it has a threat framework, it has a notable event framework, it has an adaptive response framework, and it has an assets and identities framework. We've talked about all of those apart from the threat so far. So from a threat framework perspective, what is it? Um, and this is going to develop, no doubt, um, with Splunk's acquisition of TrueStar and um, that side of things. But for now, what it is, is essentially a way of collating lots of different threat data from lots of different threat feeds. Out of the blocks, enterprise security comes with links to lots of open source threat feeds, which you can just turn on and bring it in. It also comes with a collection of local threat intelligence that you can uh, like update and, in, and like include your own threat information, just stick it in and it will start being leveraged. Once you build up this collection of threat data, which is what this threat artifacts is really, it's kind of all these kind of known bad, um, kind of situations so that's for your kind of your feeds your list of all your feeds this is your list of network information so ips and urls and host names endpoints so file intelligence registry intelligence process intelligence certificates emails email hashes that sort of thing so you get all this kind of threat information threat data and then splunk is able to scan all of the information that you get in splunk so from firewalls from endpoints from um, event logs, whatever, all of it comes in and we can scan across all of that information against the threat framework and we can then generate threat um, threat notables or threat activity. So we have a dashboard showing threat activity. So this is when a machine is connected to a known bad IP or a known bad domain or an email has got a known bad file hash or attachment or it's a, an email hash that's also got, you know, known to be a threat. Um, and we can see the threat activity across it. So we've got 202 um, matches of threat in the last 24 hours in this data. Um, and we can also create a notable event, or we can also create a risk notable, a risk event, essentially, um, and leverage the risk framework to be able to kind of narrow down the number of threat data that we're getting. Um, and it's really important to make sure that the threat data that's powering the threat framework is as good quality as possible, because if you find you're using threat data that's out of date, then you might get more notables than really is actually true. Um, and that would be false positives and all that sort of things that you don't really want to see. So as a quick stop on the threat, hopefully that's covered it. So with nine minutes to go, or you know, and I'm sure you've all got 11 o'clock appointments. Uh, I do. So <laughs> um, I'll just answer some questions. If you've got any further questions, please do bring them in. Um, before I get to the questions, um, just very quickly, if you do want to learn more um, and you do want to know more, much more about enterprise security, you want to go hands on and actually understand all of the things about enterprise security. We'll talk about all the dashboards. We'll go into much more details. We'll even talk about my one of my favorite dashboards, the domain generating algorithm dashboard, which um, we'll have to leave to another day. Um, it will be with me actually, uh, this workshop uh, the 28th of July. So if you have questions, you just want to see a lot more about enterprise security, what it does, or you just want to learn about enterprise security, or you want to quiz me, right? So that'll be an open session that you can just ask questions free form with me, um, uh, whether that's about ES or Phantom or you know UBA, whatever it is, you get me for four hours. So um, a good amount of time. Um, so that's on the 28th of July. So if you want to see that, and also if you want to get any more information, contact us in first on philassociates.com. Uh, and then finally, I'm just going to go to questions. So let me just open those questions up and then um, I can see them, which doesn't look like they want to show me at the same time as. Um, 
Right. Okay. So I've got a question here about the Splunk security essentials. Doesn't show in the Splunk Cloud app market. Does it have to be downloaded and uploaded to our managed cloud, or would we need Splunk to do this? Good question. Um, so it should be there. Uh, unfortunately, I find this. If you look in um, in manage apps, um, which uh, no doubt you're probably doing in your Splunk Cloud. Um, if you come here and go browse more apps, this is a Splunk Cloud environment as well. And if you look in Splunk security essentials and you hunt for it it never comes up or oh, it did today okay so it is there um previously it might be because it's installed already um but it comes up as um an application that should be installable i haven't found any problems with it installing i can't install because it's an es box actually so i wouldn't be able to install directly on an es box if you've got an es environment in splunk cloud they're a little bit more limited about what apps you can install on it so they don't allow you to automatically install to uh, Spark Cloud's ES instance. If you use this normal search engine, you would be able to do it. But I would recommend putting it on ES and just get the Spark Cloud team to do that. Open a ticket for them uh, and you'll be able to do that. Yeah. All right. You've just seen that as well. All right. Good. Um, any other questions? Um, please fire them in to the chat. Um, more than happy to answer them for the next next few minutes. If there's no more questions, then absolutely enjoy the rest of your day. Um, feel free to drop off. Um, I'll stay here if there are any questions dropping in, but at the moment I don't have any more questions. So um, yeah, please feel free to drop off the line and thanks for attending.